Good afternoon, uh, everybody. Hi, uh, good afternoon. My name is Amadou, Amadou Jalo. I'm the CEO of uh, DHL Global Forwarding for Middle East and Africa. Um, I've been in the organization for quite a bit. Um, I come from the, the south of Senegal, so I come from a farming family. <laughs> and uh, I'm very happy today, uh, you know, to introduce uh, our thought leadership dialogue on perishable uh, logistics, um, which is an important uh, sector for our region because, you know, um, over 60% of arable land that are available are actually in Africa today. We have 1.4 billion people living in the Middle East and Africa region. Um, there are over 600 million new consumers that need to be fed in uh, the ASEAN market, uh, there are over 700 million new consumers that need to be fed in uh, Asia, in China particularly, and more than 750 million uh, that are having the same needs in, uh, in India. So that is besides the fact that you still have you know, increasing consumption uh, in both uh, in Europe and uh, in Americas, so there's a lot of needs of people to, who need to be fed. You know, the, pro, the prognostic, prognostics are that uh, by the year 2050 latest, you know, will be over 9 billion people uh, that need consumption. I assume that it will be happening more around 2025. So there's a lot of need for solutions in order for us to be able to supply from farm to fork across all the continent. And today we'll be specifically, you know, focusing on that sector because, you know, our business, uh, our purpose is called connecting people and improving lives. Uh, but that naturally can only happen if we are properly fed. Uh, that can only happen if we can be able to deliver joy, you know, in terms of having flowers and everything that symbolizes love for most of us in all of the societies. So I'm very pleased today to introduce to you uh, two of our speakers. Uh, the second one that will be speaking, he's, he's, his name is Satish. He's actually in charge of our effort operations here in Dubai. Has been in the organization for over 20 years. Uh, he manages the largest logistics team across the Middle East and Africa region. So he'll be talking about his expertise in terms of what he has encountered, uh, you know, both uh, in terms of supply, but also in terms of servicing most of the exotic market, because as you know, our market is not only good in terms of uh, farming, uh, but it's also important in terms of tourism. So you have most of the most exciting touristic resorts uh, also around our region here, you know, if you go in Maldives or if you go in Mauritius, in many different places. So you have a lot of new hotels that have been developing in complexity that people need to visit. So they all need to be serviced. So Satish should be talking about that. But before we go to Satish, you know, we have uh, Sadvik Jaitley, uh, who is joining us uh, from uh, Frost & Sullivan, which is the company that we have been associating with to produce our white paper that will be soon shared with you. So without further ado, I would like to let Satish talk about the trends and uh, findings that we have had uh, in the research that paper that they, 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 they produce together with DHL. And after that, Satish will enlighten you in terms of you know, what are the real operational uh, solutions that we have put in place. I hope you'll have an enjoyable afternoon if you are in uh, the Middle East and Africa region, or you will have a great morning if you are joining us from the US, or that it will help you avoid the cold if you are calling from Germany or from all, all of these European countries. You know, and I think it is a good diversion towards talking about COVID. So besides COVID, we still need to eat properly. Uh, we still need to be dressed properly and then to have good smells in our places. So I hope you enjoy this session. And the same is naturally, you know, valid for our colleagues uh, or friends that are joining us from uh, Asia, you know, or Australia, because there it's almost uh, evening. Uh, so, you know, you can enjoy your evening without watching some of your know, funny sports events so rather than getting your brain fed. So, thank you very much and have a nice time, please. Satvik Jaitley, yeah? Satvik, thank you so over to you. For, thank you so much for those kind words, sir. Uh, absolutely, truly said, despite the pandemic, despite what happens in the world, uh, 
food is an essential necessity that we all need in our lives in order to fight any kind of calamity that is happening in the world. And that is why uh, we are proud to be working with DHL and uh, moving ahead and providing the insights as well as certain data points on the emerging market trends and disruptions in the Middle East and Africa food and beverage industry. Uh, next slide, please. So I'd like to introduce, my name is Satwik Jaitley. I work as the food and nutrition consultant uh, for Frost & Sullivan. Uh, my speciality lies in growth consulting, market research, R&D, and innovation. And uh, I have worked across the food and beverage value chain, uh, right from product formulation, R&D, towards uh, product distribution, and innovation, and uh, registration of intellectual property. So if we quickly go through today's agenda, we'll be covering, first of all, the geopolitical and economic outlook. Uh, it is increasingly important in light of the current factors that we are living in. And uh, we are also going to cover the overview of the Middle East and Africa food and beverage industry. Then we we'll look at some uh, key trends which are impacting the whole value chain in the Middle East. And then we'll conclude with a future Next slide, please. Then, next slide, please. Moving on uh, to the year 2020. What can I say that hasn't already been said? Uh, we are looking at a global recession. Recovery is ongoing uh, through various uh, international uh, agencies. We have got to know that a recovery is uh, planned or is underway for majority of the regions in the world. But at the same time, we are looking at two very distinct uh, recovery scenarios. One, in an optimistic outlook, we are looking at a stretched V curve, wherein the recovery is expected to start from Q4 of 2020, something that we're already well past. And uh, go, we are looking at a full recovery by Q4 of 2021. In a pessimistic scenario, we are looking at a U curve wherein the recovery is going to start only from quarter one, 2021, while the full recovery will take another year by the first quarter of 2022. And that is where we currently see the recovery, the economic recovery happening with the Middle East recovery looking like a stretch weaker while the African recovery scenario is more close to a U curve. Next slide, please. Now, if we look at GCC first, uh, yes, it's a region that is going through a lot of transformation. Uh, there is uh, a lot of effort and reforms being done to move away from uh, the, you know, from the economy which has traditionally been dependent on oils and uh, try to expand their manufacturing subsectors. Food and beverage obviously play a crucial role in that. Keep in mind, GCC is a region that uh, depends almost 90% uh, on imports for meeting its own domestic food needs, thereby putting more pressure on the food and beverage manufacturers to become increasingly self-dependent and to reduce the reliance of imports, something that has been a stark realization with this pandemic. Next slide, please. We are looking at... Uh, the $2.8 trillion economy for GCC by 2030, based on different estimates. What is very interesting to understand here is that the GCC's demands or the GCC's growth will have to be fueled by overseas partners, at least when we're talking about food and beverage, perishable, and essentially anything which is part of the agri value chain, uh, agriculture and technology value chain, the region is climatically challenged in order to, uh, you know, in order to grow stuff, in order to process it, and in order to keep it in storage for a longer period of time. And that is where, next slide, please, uh, the economic imperatives emerge for the F&B industry from the current economic outlook. We are looking at identification of key economic drivers. Uh, we are uh, coming from a low base. The GDP growth rates in sub-Saharan Africa are likely to be higher in comparison to Asia. 
we are uh, looking at a lot of efforts being done particularly for the africa region uh, for food poverty eradication and uh, in the gcc on a completely contrasting level you are looking at uh, increased uh, urbanization and uh, a strong deviation towards package fnb what is also interesting to note is that the expenditure on fnb as a percentage of total consumption is uh, increasing and is going to be significantly higher as uh, lockdowns uh, have happened in this particular year and people have gotten used to cooking at home consuming at home and storing at home what is happening over here is there's a loss for the other arm of the food and beverage value chain which is called hotels restaurants and catering and uh, it has been the gain of the retail arm where horeca or hotels restaurants and catering is losing in in essence uh, identification of key pockets within uh, middle east and africa is what is recommended uh, for example you look at the west african food industry it has been benefiting from strong population growth and an economic recovery process uh, we are looking at uh, more and more young urbanized professionals or millennials becoming part of the consuming value chain and they are dictating the terms of how food is grown how it is processed and definitely how it is consumed next slide please now with this particular background we go and take a quick overview of the middle east and africa food and beverage industry next slide please uh, we look at the north african west african central southern and eastern african markets compiled with the gcc and uh, we are looking at a 650 billion us dollar food and beverage market uh, bifurcated between retail and horeca like i explained what has happened Interestingly, in the past year, is even the traditionally higher horeca shares of GCC have dropped down. This particular data is for 2019. The current ongoing data research that we have for 2020 says that the share for the hotels, restaurants, and catering, or the food service sector, has dropped close to 20 percent, and that's a huge drop considering. The tourism hubs that have uh, come to define the GCC sector. While we look at West Africa, where Nigeria has become the dominant player pushing the region forward, and uh, regional focus uh, for West Africa has been to improve staple production and to increase food affordability. Because whether we like it or not, we are living in a world where uh, malnutrition and obesity are both coexisting while one third of our food actually goes to waste and this is where the logistics of food holds so much more importance uh, so much more crucial so that we actually understand uh, the farm to fork value chain connection and how exactly we are going ahead and achieving that next slide please if we look at the first major category we are looking at grains and cereals uh, naturally because of the center of plate uh, quantity of grains and cereals we are looking at a healthy growth rate of around five more than five percent five point two percent to be precise wherein the whole value chain from harvesting through short-term storage to processing and then actually going towards the retail or the public all of it needs to be waste proof that is the key uh, you know concern plaguing the grains and cereal value chain how do you extract the maximum value from uh, the actually harvested product some of the growth drivers includes the rising population uh, there's a lot of activity happening in agri technology both in middle east and in africa uh, we are looking at uh, high technology farms we are looking at uh, automated farming we are looking at hydroponics aeroponics aquaponics all making a considerable impact in the way food is uh, traditionally grown processed and consumed we are also looking at a uh, growing process categories for example the breakfast cereal category is gaining a lot of prominence and popularity and uh, aid to that the recent export focus from africa uh, which has the potential and the capacity to become the food bowl for the rest of the world, starting first with its neighbor, the GCC. Next slide, please. 
Then we move on to dairy. Uh, there's a rising demand for from consumers for processed dairy and nutrition-rich milk products, which would drive the demand. And uh, it has to be aided by modernization and accessibility of cold chain logistics. Again, that is where the role of players like DHL becomes increasingly more important. Uh, we are looking at improved livestock management as being one of the key drivers besides uh, rising population and increased uh, processing. And also cold chain uh, deployment has increased uh, uh, by a large extent, Satish will be, you know, shedding some light on it, I believe, in his section. And uh, essentially, we are looking at a growth rate of close to 2 to 3%, 2.6% to be precise, in the next coming five years. Next slide, please. Uh, then we move on to bakery products. Again, uh, an offshoot of the grains and cereals category. We are expecting uh, a growth rate of 3.3% uh, in the coming five years. Uh, a lot of automation-based processing technologies have already made a mark for both uh, the Middle East and Africa region. Uh, it enjoys a center placement uh, also in the health and wellness-oriented diet, something that we'll be going through in much detail uh, in our coming slides, wherein we'll be tapping into health and wellness as being one of the major mega trends which are going to impact uh, the food and beverage landscape of the region. Next slide, please. Then uh, we move on to fruits and vegetables. Uh, again, there's a rising prevalence of agri-technology and uh, there's a lot of uh, focus from the consumers on the health and wellness quotient of fruits and vegetables, both of which are going to drive the market. Uh, we are looking at... Uh, Middle East, if you look at Middle East or GCC as a region, uh, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Kuwait, they are counted as uh, the regions or the countries with the highest uh, prevalence of obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular issues, you name it. What has happened very interestingly with the whole COVID uh, pandemic reaching uh, that part of the world is that the consumer has suddenly become much more aware. It has suddenly become much more concerned with the idea of health and wellness, uh, particularly so because uh, recent reports have said that uh, inadequate food uh, consumption of fruits and vegetables has a direct correlation with your obesity, which in turn has a direct correlation with how much you are proponent for uh, contracting COVID-19. So it's a really serious part of the value chain that has uh, garnered interest both from consumers as well as the regulatory agencies, something that we'll go through in more details in coming slides. Next slide, please. Then we come to poultry, center of the plate uh, food product and uh, recent advancements on livestock management uh, have certainly given a boom to the industry. We are looking at a growth rate of around 4.9% uh, for poultry, wherein uh, from farming, through segregation, through processing, and then on to packaging. There's a lot of innovation happening, uh, both in the fresh chill as well as in the pro uh, frozen chicken space as well. Next slide, please. Then we move on to red meat. Again, uh, expecting a he healthy growth rate of 4.3%, wherein uh, improved livestock management will drive the growth. Uh, Globalization of cuisine has been one of the major factors, even pre-COVID and even more so uh, after the COVID, wherein uh, globally accepted cuisines have made their way uh, onto the affluent uh, consumer base. You know, people are more and more aware on the different kinds of steak. People are more and more aware on how uh, different kinds of meat are prepared, are interacted. Social media has been one of the key proponents for that. And uh, we believe uh, the, this particular thing is to drive the market uh, because uh, reduced mortality rates has been one of the key areas of focus of the governments in the region as well. Next slide, please. So essentially what has happened is uh, this trend was happening even pre-COVID, but post-COVID there has been a barrage of information directed towards the consumer. And the consumer, uh, you can call them Gen Y, you can call them Millennials, Gen Z. Every, uh, every section of the consumers, I would say, has become what we call the Gen I consumer. 
the I stands for intelligent, informed, inquisitive, interactive, instinctive, and indulgent. They are more concerned about things like being overweight, uh, having high cholesterol, uh, losing hair, and uh, thinking more and more about stress because being locked down at home, uh, where work from home has become a major part, wherein you don't have access to your daily activities, has impacted a lot on the mental health as well. And because of which, around 67% of consumers are actively making changes in their diet. They realize the role that their diet plays in their physical and mental health. And if you simply do a comparison of 52% being overweight, 33% being worried about high cholesterol, 30% worried about losing hair, 28% being worried about stress, 67% of the uh, sample consumer base talking about active changes in lifestyle uh, opens up a whole plethora of opportunities, especially for healthy uh, perishables or food categories, such as uh, fruits and vegetables and health and wellness products. Uh, they are intelligent and informed because they are aware about the ingredient and the composition, nearly 38% of the sample population. Uh, they consume information from multiple sources, applies to 74% of the population. Uh, social media, word of mouth, company websites, and your standard above the line uh, advertisements from uh, television, print media, and so on and so forth. Consumers are also becoming inquisitive and interactive, wherein 30% of consumers are looking towards things like minimally processed, uh, they want natural origins, they are looking at clean labels, they are instinctive and indulgent, and they are ready to try new products. Next slide, please. Because of all of this, we are now going to deep dive into some of the key disruptive food and beverage trends in the region. Next slide, please. We are looking at the rise of lifestyle and food-related disorders, uh, wherein cardiovascular issues are the most prevalent health conditions. Uh, we are looking at a WHO-mandated global target of 30% reduction in salt intake by 2035. If the current health crisis is in any way led by, this target will be more severely produced in the coming years. And... Uh, the health and wellness food and beverage sector in the MIA region is expected to have a CAGR of a whopping 8%, uh, which is incidentally faster than the healthcare sector, which is expected to grow at 5.3% itself. And uh, eradication of artificial trans fat, reduction of 5% per year in the average of saturated fat, salt and sugar are some of the more notable initiatives that are being pushed through by World Health Organization. Next slide, please. We are looking at the advent of health and wellness from niche to the mainstream of food and beverages. Uh, we talk to a lot of stakeholders. Uh, we talk to chefs. We talk to F&B product managers, and we talk to the retail managers. Uh, numbers speak for themselves. Uh, executive chefs, which are at hotels, say that eating healthy is not a fad. They interact with consumers on a daily basis. Uh, they are actively also going to redesign their menu. Close to 75% of the respondents said that, yes, they are going to redesign the menu. 65% of the packaged food and beverage product managers are committed to a change in the claims on uh, the impact of their products on general health. 35% of product developers are still not sure whether or not they need to change their whole uh, product strategy. And 90% uh, of retail managers confirm that there is an on-ground shift in consumer buying behavior. People are reading labels. People are finding out more about their origins while they are making their purchases. Next slide, please. Now, because of all of this uh, and in light of COVID and uh, given the trade-driven nature of the Middle East and Africa food market, what are some of the evolving business models? Uh, if you look at those, then we are looking delivery. There's a huge food delivery boom post-pandemic and uh, the growth numbers are in the range of 50 to 70 percent for unique online customers in the MENA region. Uh, food delivery used to be a nice to have uh, activity if you're a food service chain but now it has reached the must-have status. 
we are also looking at rise and rise of organic uh, gcc organic market itself is estimated to be around uh, 18 billion us dollars in 2019 and uh, farm to fork freshness this is where a lot of uh, activity needs to be done uh, from partners like dhl in order to facilitate that the produce from uh, africa such as fruits vegetables poultry and meat are on the right track of the logistics framework to reach the ever-consuming Middle East and uh, essentially bridge the gap between the ever-consuming and the ever-producing. In between, we are looking at the growth of value-added categories such as noodles, biscuits, ready-to-eat meals. Uh, they not only provide uh, value in terms of taste, flavor, and format, they are also crucial in order to uh, eliminate and limit uh, the amount of food which is wasted. Something which has been going on behind the curtain for a long time but now has gained mainstream attention is the contract overseas farming done by the GCC countries in Africa. For example, KSA's uh, Manafia Holding has uh, uh, 125 million uh, invested uh, in uh, 500 and uh, 5,000 hectare farm in Zambia. Then Saudi Star Agriculture, Hassad Foods, and UAE governments are some more examples. So essentially, the seeds of growth are there. Uh, they need to be given the right set of fertilizer in order for them to actually grow ahead. Next slide, please. Then with all of this in mind, we move on towards the conclusion. Next slide. Wherein uh, we are looking at which are the key opportunities within the food and beverage space for the region. Mm -hmm. uh, we see the need for cross value chain focus, uh, which is going to be a key differentiator to capitalize on the current disruption in the aftermath of COVID-19. Uh, food delivery services, uh, prevention of supply chain disruption. Uh, now it has happened for a fact that most of the food and beverage processing companies and consumers both realize the value of a strong logistics framework and supply chain and they are realizing what distance their food actually travels before it reaches onto their plate then we are looking at the prevalence of retail segment as the horeca segment is shifting uh, we are also seeing uh, a lot of growth emerging for e-commerce where in africa e-commerce penetration while it is currently limited uh, but it has uh, the right set of opportunities, it has the right set of consumer demand if uh, we are able to provide the right set of infrastructure. So, in essence, these are some of the growth opportunities and these are some of the trends that are emerging from the region. Next slide, please. And uh, for any further information, uh, you can reach out to us and uh, do let us know if we can contribute any queries that you may have. Uh, over to you, Satish, and over to your able hands to take all of us through the logistics framework. Thank you, Satvik. That was interesting. It's good, uh, good evening here in Dubai. Uh, those for whom it is good morning, uh, good afternoon uh, from DHL Global Forwarding Dubai. Uh, my name is Satish, I'm the head of air freight customs and value added services for DHL Global Forwarding in Dubai. I've been in this industry for the last uh, 27 years and with DGF in Dubai for the last uh, 20 years. Uh, Satvik took us in detail uh, to the uh, trends and analysis on uh, the regional uh, perishable uh, industry. Uh, it was having enough numbers, data, uh, study. Uh, I'm going to take a different approach. Uh, I will be talking about more of the operational scenarios, uh, the challenges that we face, uh, the ground realities in handling perishables in the region. Here in Dubai, we started our perishable journey uh, three to four years ago. And at that time, what we seen in the market was uh, the distribution and the imports of foodstuff into the region was uh, limited to very small importing houses. 
uh, very well structured in their operations, uh, a very small trade forwarding community handling this as niche products. And for the new entrants, for the new business, it was confusion. There was challenges, chaos, uh, lack of knowledge on the registration process, um, lack of, um, uh, or you can say the uh, non-reliability of the suppliers used, uh, inspection delays, uh, rejections for not matching with what was declared as in the documents against was what was physically identified by the inspectors uh, at import. Even we had seen uh, major delays in uh, identifying the samples uh, against uh, what was uh, uh, imported. So an inspector at the airport asked for a sample and the customer struggling to find out that samples uh, damages, uh, claims, the blame game. So it was not that rosy picture uh, always in the perishable industry. What we did is, like Satwik said, that we have uh, the region abandoned with food in Africa, the, the food basket, and then we have um, uh, Middle East, where 90% of the food stuff uh, needs to be uh, imported. So the opportunity is within the region. The opportunity is from Europe. So we did not jump into these opportunities. We took a very calculated risk. We studied about how we will enter into this uh, perishable sector. And what we did differently is to have a perishable desk in Dubai first. That was the beginning of having a perishable desk in Dubai, which is now 24-7 uh, operational. Uh, we started with uh, identifying passionate uh, freight forwarders from the team, uh, training them, uh, getting external trainings. We have expertise in other part of the world. We have the DHL food logistics. We have the team in Italy, France, uh, Australia. We learned from them the best practices and we made ourselves ready to handle the perishable. Now we handle around 25 to 35 tons of uh, perishable food stuff only from Italy. Just from Italy, uh, it ranges from poultry, dairy, cookies, sweets, olives, or meat, uh, what is needed into the shelves of uh, Spinnies and Carfos in Dubai, we are heavily involved in that import. So what we learned uh, and what we understood from our journey in the perishable sector is six important factors. One and the most important is to know the expectations of your customer. The shelves to be filled, uh, the requirements at the supermarkets, the week sales, the, uh, the day that they want the goods in the shelves, whether it is for hotels, whether it is for events, understanding the customer requirement is key focus. Second is understanding the supplier, especially in Europe. The suppliers have their own pattern for manufacturing. They do not compromise always for the uh, logistics benefit. They are more onto the quality of the manufacturing process. So we need to understand what the supplier do, how they manage the production, when is the shipment getting ready, when it will be transported, what are the packaging materials. Understanding the supplier is also crucial. Third, the capability of our origin stations. When the supplier delivers the shipment to the destinations, we need to know well, whether our origin stations are capable to handle the volumes, value-added services, a double dating, ULD buildups, uh, uh, quality checks, are they capable to do that? That is crucial because during this pandemic uh, time, what we see in Europe is the uh, lack of transport options, road restrictions, and lockdowns 
so if the origin stations of dgf are not capable to cater to the requirements of what the supplier does then we have a challenge another important factor is knowing the product the temperature requirements the documentation requirements the shelf life is very crucial and another is having a reliable partner the consistency of the flights we have not seen any interruption during this pandemic for our uh, perishable imports and that was because of the selection of reliable partners that we had we import most of the uh, perishables through our own dhl aviation flights which is very consistent and we also have commercial reliable partners to the great extent during this pandemic uh, due to the less frequencies and due to the uh, less capacity even in that challenging situation we in dhl global forwarding were able to Uh, manage the supply chain of logistics for our customers uninterruptedly because of this reliable partnership and the last and most important is the destination uh, facilities that we have uh, the coordination with the customer uh, the notifications to the customer the uh, retrieval of the goods uh, the facilities and the help to give um, inspection assistance and uh, sub- and uh, support for the inspection uh, certification process even invoicing is important because each and every food importer needs to get the landed cost to define the uh, uh, the cost of his product so everything in the supply chain is very crucial and this is what we as dhl global forwarding was keen in supporting our customers and that is the success story that we have to share it's not only from italy that we now import we also now uh, bring uh, food stuff from amsterdam we are uh, heavily into fruits and vegetables from netherlands uh, we are into uh, sweets uh, meat uh, leaves uh, chicken uh, so we now understand the complexities of each commodity we also understand what is the require, requirement and the expectation of the uh, customer what we do differently is to enhance our, ourselves with the knowledge uh, the trends in the industry we have uh, great experts in the perishable sector in europe uh, our italy office or france Uh, austria spain uh, australia norway food and perishable departments are actually the motivational factors for us we learn a lot from them we travel a lot uh, we go to the exhibitions uh, food festivals fruit logistics we see our customers there uh, we see their suppliers we talk the same language even one of the biggest contracts of uh, in dubai Uh, we signed in france during the cial uh, food exhibition so the learnings never ends uh, the latest technology the trends um, what is needed in the industry uh, what is differently happening what are the best practices all this enhancements we learn we have from our team and that makes us um, a bit different and makes uh, our customer happy to know the latest trends that we introduce whether it is in uh, data loggers whether it is in packaging materials or any new trends in the industry <clears throat> it's not only uh, just uh, uh, exports uh, just not it's not only just imports that we handle here in dubai we also handle exports it is surprising to many Uh, that uh, dubai is heavily involved in exports of perishables uh, and food stuff uh, dubai is the favorite uh, exporting station for many of the resorts in the region uh, baku seychelles maldives these resort destinations are heavily depending upon dubai for the food stuff <coughs> uh, especially maldives which is very closely um, uh, 
very close to the food manufacturing houses like India, uh, Sri Lanka, or Indonesia, they still depend upon uh, Dubai uh, for the food uh, and perishables to the resorts, uh, mainly because of the abundant of uh, food stuff uh, in the region, having the redistribution in Dubai, the proximity, the reliability of the airlines, and then the quality of the food stuff that is available here in Dubai, um, the ease of doing business uh, from fruit market, from the vegetable uh, meat market. Uh, even we have uh, a chef in his resort sending the uh, menu to his hotel supplier in Dubai. And in the morning, the list is prepared in the noon, uh, the shopping happens at the fruit markets or vegetable market and by evening it is delivered to the airport. We do the customs documentation and transfer into uh, transfer to the carriers during the late uh, evening flights. It flies in the night, arrives uh, Maldives um, early morning and the speedboats ready to pick it uh, to the resort. So it's such well coordinated um, and uh, knit, well knitted uh, operational activities is happening in Dubai uh, to these resort destinations and we are proud to be a part of this uh, exports. Uh, we have a huge market share into the exports of perishables from uh, Dubai. The market itself has around 750 to 800 tons of perishables going just to Maldives uh, from Dubai. Uh, not only Dubai in the region, we have Oman, our neighboring country, from GCC, the Oman is heavily involved into the exports of beans. Uh, our DHL Global Forwarding colleagues are handling around 500 tons of beans to Japan uh, from Muscat. Uh, they have for this season. Our um, Lebanese office is exporting uh, chocolates to uh, Kuwait. Our um, African stations are heavily involved into the exports of flowers and the fruits and vegetables. So the learning uh, and the involvement of DGF into the perishable sector is becoming more and more uh, rooted. What we see differently is the passion that we have in uh, moving this food stuff, the satisfaction that we get in uh, delivering a food consignment uh, with uh, a clean POD gives us uh, the satisfaction. Now, uh, there are new trends emerging. As uh, Satwik said, that everyone is into cooking food. Uh, the requirements have become different. It's online, mostly. E-commerce is also now engrossing into the food industry. Uh, we are not into the last mile delivery of uh, uh, e-commerce on foodstuffs, but we are heavily involved into the uh, imports to the fulfillment centers. So actually during this pandemic, uh, the volumes that we are handling is much higher than that we used to uh, handle during the pre-COVID times. So the volumes of foodstuffs that we are currently handling is much higher. The requirements is uh, much more. Uh, the demands are much uh, more demanding now. The time frame is much less. Uh, so there is a lot of learning. There is a lot of efforts put into it. There are even requirements from some of our customers to have cool stores close to the airport. We are also thinking of having uh, cool stores uh, close to the city limits so that we can serve uh, our customers better. So the learning never ends. Each day there is new learnings. The support that we get from the network, uh, the support that we get from the learnings, what like uh, Satvik and Frost and Sullivan is giving, uh, the learnings, the expertise gives us more and more expertise uh, to serve our, our customers. We look forward for more and more such events. Uh, food festivals and uh, exhibitions are not going to happen for the near future but then we have a lot of um, trade fairs, virtual fairs like this, and we will be heavily involved in supporting our customers. Uh, thank you all. Hello, everyone.
Um, welcome also from my side. My name is Alice Morales. I'm responsible for marketing for DHL Global Forward in Middle Eastern Africa. Thank you so much, Patrick and Satish, for your presentations. We are now opening the floor for questions. So please, if uh, anyone from the audience has any questions, you can uh, just type them into the slide chat, chat box you have on your screen. So I would like to kick it off with the first question. Yeah, so uh, that's in light with the, the pandemic that we're currently living through. So the question is, how has the food and beverage market changed now during COVID-19 times? Um, Satvik, perhaps you can start? Yeah, thank you so much, Alice. And uh, it's a very pertinent question. I believe it's a question that uh, I've encountered on numerous engagements uh, since the pandemic kick started. Uh, the bottom line is everybody's got to eat and you cannot fight a pandemic on an empty stomach. Uh, food occupies the base of the Maslow's hierarchy of need, means it is even more important uh, than a lot of other things that are more valuable. Now, having said that, uh, what is crucial is to make sure that the food is reaching in the adequate supply uh, to the last person in the line. Uh, there is no shortage, uh, not just in the modern trade and modern retail outlets that we see around us, but even in the non-urban areas that we see. And uh, while for uh, average urban consumer, the pandemic has... Uh, re alleviated the fears around immunity, fears around health. Uh, is there enough food or do I need to stockpile? What also happened is for the non-urban or for the rural consumer, uh, shortages have become a fear and that has led to stockpiling and that has led to a lot of inflation and uh, added pressure on the supply chain. And I'm pretty sure Satish can add his value onto this as well. Wherein making sure that uh, you are consuming what you are supposed to eat uh, on a daily basis without putting pressure on, uh, on food categories, which otherwise uh, you, know, you, you are going to have for indulgence. And that is where I believe a monumental shift has happened uh, from people consuming food for leisure or people consuming food for special occasions. Now it has become back to sustenance, back to energy, and back to health and wellness. Thank you, Satvik. Yes, exactly. So Satish, if you can enlighten us from a logistics perspective, how has it uh, impacted us as, as logistics company? Yes, exactly. As Satvik said, uh, the, the, what is coming now is essentials. Uh, uh, it's not that the luxury of having anything and everything transported and checking whether it will survive or sustain in the market, those experiments are not happening. What is now coming is what is actually needed for the public. So there is, a, 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 it has brought a little bit of a discipline and uh, things are happening, uh, what is needed for the public. That's what we see the difference during the pandemic. Thank you so much. So the next question is a little bit more um, specific. So I, I believe um, Satvik, that's addressed to you on, on the dairy and milk products. Do you expect the demand for milk uh, powder and formulas imports for Africa and Middle East to increase similar to what is happening to, uh, in China? Yeah, definitely. Uh, it's a very pertinent question about a category which, uh, if you look at it, holds the most amount of uh, nutrition and uh, has the most uh, established value chain, right? Uh, from milking to processing to consumption in your daily cuisine or in your daily diet, dairy has always been one of the you know earliest known foods that man has been having. Now, what has happened is uh, milk powder or formula imports are definitely have come to the forefront wherein uh, wherever there are supply chain disruptions, uh, if you look at South Asia perspective, particularly uh, wherever there has been a disruption uh, specifically for the kids diet or for the children diet, uh, milk powder and formula have come back onto the limelight. Uh, we are expecting similar trends to happen uh, for Africa as well. 
wherein uh, the nutritional aspect of uh, the per capita food consumption, uh, which is unfortunately pretty low right now in Central Africa and surrounding regions, we expect that to pick up, uh, you know, with more and more awareness, more and more efforts, uh, largely accredited to the hyperconnected world that we're living in, wherein the nutritional aspect of dairy will see a rise and uh, definitely milk powders and formula imports are at the core of it. Very interesting. Thank you, Satvik. So uh, let's talk about uh, the, the growth opportunities in, in this sector. So, um, so in your opinion, which are the growth opportunities in this region um, that you believe ho are hosting the most potential in the future? Okay, so I believe the biggest growth opportunities uh, will be emerging from understanding the consumer behavior. Doesn't matter if you're B2C, doesn't matter if you're B2B. Ultimately, it's about edge to edge, right? You have to understand when you're talking about a commodity like food, how the food consumption happens, how it is impacted, what people are eating and what people are not eating. For example, the Maldives example, it's a beautiful example that Satish just gave us right now, wherein the chef prefers, despite having a nearer source, to be getting the produce specifically from Dubai. Why is that? because it fulfills the particular need for that particular chef. And whether we like it or not, as individuals or as populations, we do have certain nutrition needs that need to be met. So firstly, understanding the consumers will give you the growth opportunities. Some of the top of the mind growth opportunities that I'd like to share include health and wellness foods. Secondly, any category that requires uh, uh, logistics in terms of e-commerce because accessibility has been the biggest learning from this particular pandemic. Things have become more and more accessible, whether it's knowledge, uh, whether it's uh, understanding about different cultures, different cuisines. So growth opportunities basically lie in understanding the health and wellness trend. And secondly, they lie in uh, understanding that the e-commerce part which is right now a niche segment in Africa and also in some parts of the Middle East, will play a crucial and large role going forward. But to facilitate that e-commerce, you what you require is a robust value chain, a robust supply chain that is cross-value chain from production to processing to consumption. Thank you, Satvik. Uh, Satish, any, any inputs on the, on the growth of the sector uh, from a logistics perspective? See, uh, from a logistics perspective, uh, the health and wellness products increase is something that we have seen a sudden drastic increase in those uh, products. Before it was, uh, it was, it is coming in huge quantities. And even if you see what is coming now by air, is mostly food and perishables and food supplements and the health and uh, wellness products. So I think uh, as what is needed now uh, to the market is what is coming. There is no wastage happening and uh, things are happening in the right way. That's what I feel. Thank you, Satish. Another question from our audience. Um, the question is, what do you think about the implementation of global standards for perishable, uh, for perishables, sorry, as in life science and healthcare? Okay. So uh, I believe globalization of standards is a definite must right now. Uh, we are seeing, uh, you know, Particularly to Middle East, let's take the example of halal in terms of uh, certification. If we take the example of uh, putting up a certain standard, it has always existed in the Middle East. Uh, what has been increasingly interesting is uh, the amount of halal food that has gained the demand in regions like Europe and North America as well. So whether uh, it is coming from one centralized agency or whether it's coming directly from the consumers, it is very interesting to understand and to note the fact that consumers themselves are looking at some kind of a benchmark 
uh, when it comes to food products, uh, when it comes to perishables. And uh, this is something which is very heartening because uh, once you get that, you get a very streamlined value chain. You understand exactly how the growth has to be, how the production has to be there, how it has to be processed, and in the end, how it has to be transported and stored. Thank you, Sadrik. Um, so we are coming actually to an end of, of our time. Um, but I would like to thank you, Sadrik and Satish, for all your inputs on the food, beverages, perishables uh, sector it has been very insightful. Uh, I also would like to uh, remind everyone that in the virtual trade fair, you can walk around and get to download a few more content about not only perishables, but also other solutions and products of digital global forwarding. Uh, on Wednesday, in this same platform, we will have another presentation um, about vaccines logistics. So, so it's a trending topic, right? A hot topic at the moment. And we will be uh, giving some insights on life science, life science and healthcare and how we are getting ready to move the COVID-19 vaccines. So just use the same platform, the same login details to tune in in the, in the, in the presentation on Wednesday. Um, I also noticed uh, someone has asked us if uh, the presentations will be shared. Yes, so we stay tuned in the DHR Global Forward in Middle East and Africa social media channels. We will be sharing some articles uh, about the industry and we will be sharing also the white paper. So, so yes, the, the content of, of this presentation and furthermore will be shared with, um, with everyone through our social media. So once again, thank you so much and thank you for, for the participation of our audience and we hope to see you again on Wednesday in the Vaccines Logistics uh, presentation. Thank you, Satish. Thank you, Safik, and uh, see you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.